Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are going to get started here today with our Committed to Community webinar featuring Congressman DeFazio and an incredible panel of uh, community members and leaders who are engaged in uh, conversations on the regular about transit in our community um, or are frequent users of the transit system in our community and, and can provide some really great context about the importance of uh, of robust transit infrastructure. My name is Brittany Quickcorner. I'm the president and CEO here at the Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce. And we're excited to co-host this event with the Springfield Area Chamber of Commerce. And thank you to Vani Mickelson and her team for helping to get the word out there about this important conversation. Uh, our, our organization, and I know Springfield as well, has uh, been engaged in conversations around transportation for I think our, the entirety of our existence at the chamber, we have um, been a, a founding kind of uh, supporter of the Eugene Airport back, you know, decades ago. Uh, we have been active in conversations around uh, bus rapid transit and the expansion of the MX uh, route in our community. And not to mention just conversations around how do we make sure that our roads and our infrastructure are, are put together and are up to kept in a way that our goods and services can be trans, transferred around our community and inside and out of our community. It's really important for businesses um, and for community members to have a really uh, a, an effective and efficient working transit system. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. And Congressman DeFazio um, is I think one of our, our local experts that we are incredibly lucky to have representing us at the federal level in this conversation. He has been a leader in transportation and infrastructure conversations uh, since he's been in uh, elected office. And so we're grateful to have you today, Congressman DeFazio. I do wanna say first off before we get started, a huge shout out to Oregon Community Credit Union. They are the supporting sponsor for this webinar series and have come in financially and also just with their staff support to help make sure that we can get the word out to the broader community about resources and things that can help businesses and community members thrive. So thank you, OCCU, we appreciate you. So without further ado, I'm gonna toss it over to Congressman DeFazio. I am uh, very, very grateful to have you here this morning and we will let you kind of kick things off and then I'll get into introducing our panelists. Okay, thanks, Brittany. Um... Yeah, the, the focus for today is transit. Obviously, uh, the package is much bigger uh, than transit for my committee. It's roads, bridges, highways, transit, rail, and wastewater. Uh, I did a wastewater uh, roundtable at the end of last week uh, statewide, and we had an incredible amount of interest. There are so many uh, communities in the state under DEQ mandates. The federal government has been partnering, so it's way bigger. But today, we're going to focus uh, on transit. Now, uh, you know, transit obviously was incredibly uh, hard hit uh, by the pandemic. Uh, you know, we actually had, uh, you know, transit workers uh, contact uh, COVID and die. Uh, you know, they had, uh, you know, extraordinary drop off in ridership. They had new requirements uh, to get PPE for their workers, uh, to disinfect, uh, you know, the vehicles in ways they never had before. So not only did they have a huge revenue drop, in fact, uh, LTD for a while went to zero fares just to minimize uh, contact. Uh, but they also, uh, you know, uh, had uh, you know all these other expenses. The uh, that was we recognized that uh, we provided some money early on in the first cares, and then in this last package, the rescue package. You got to distinguish between these two packages. There's a rescue package, which is mitigation of the individual payments. Uh, payments to business, uh, payments to sectors that have been particularly hard hit, in this case, uh, $30 billion to transit. Uh, Eugene's share of that $30 billion will be uh, uh, $32 million, $500. Portland's going to get $330 million. Corvallis, $1 million. Uh, Grants Pass, uh, $288. Albany, $358, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it's spread pretty wide. Uh, and the idea of that is uh, for them to continue to provide service, uh, particularly, you know, I mean, elderly and others still need it, disabled still need it. Uh, we have critical workers uh, who need the transit. So to continue to provide service as robustly as possible, and also uh, to keep their workers off of the uh, unemployment rolls. So um, 
you know, this, uh, what we're doing in this proposal from the president uh, is uh, uh, what I would call, uh, you know, we, we, we would be at about Eisenhower 8.0 if we did what we've been doing repetitively through all the uh, acts since I've been in Congress and before I was in Congress. It's the 21st century. Uh, infrastructure is wearing out. Transit has a hundred billion dollar backlog for state of good repair, let alone building out new transit options for people, uh, getting to underserved communities, uh, and uh, you know improving transit service, electrifying uh, you know our buses, uh, and uh, otherwise uh, mitigating uh, climate change uh, through the investments uh, in transit. Uh, so. Um, you know, we're looking, I, my bill was last year was very ambitious. I had 106% increase in transit funding. Uh, the president has proposed 140%. Uh, and I can very productively find ways to spend that money and actually deal with state of good repair more quickly and, uh, and get more uh, uh, options out to people. And we're not just doing uh, urban areas. I mean, obviously that's a major focus of the bill. Uh, but we're sensitive to smaller cities and rural areas, uh, you know, people uh, aging in place in places uh, outside of, say, Coos Bay, North Bend, uh, you know, uh, having uh, transit on demand so they can get to the doctor and continue to stay in their homes and benefits uh, them, benefits the society. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's critical. So uh, this is a, a very, very broad uh, package uh, we're proposing. Uh, we're also not ignoring uh, cycling pedestrian. Uh, Going to put six billion into what we call active transportation, and active transportation, particularly for younger people, uh, and for many others, is their link to uh, transit. Uh, get there on your bike. Uh, get there by walking. Uh, get there by scooter. Should wear a helmet. And um, you know, that, those are the links we want to encourage uh, so that, and, and the other thing is we're gonna create new measures for transit. Uh, we've measured in terms of return previously. No, we're gonna measure in terms of frequency and efficiency, uh, cause that's what people need. Uh, if we're gonna encourage more people to use transit, it has to be more reliable, that is state of good repair. And it also has to be more frequent uh, to meet uh, their busy schedules. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, impose uh, new measures there. And as I mentioned previously, we're going to look at electrification. There'll be substantial federal investment electrification because it's not only acquiring the electric buses, which long term will have lower maintenance costs, but there's an acquisition cost. Then there's also the charging stations. Uh, and we're going to make uh, provisions for that. And all this, of course, uh, will be federal money. Uh, so it comes with the strongest Buy America requirements of any agency of the federal government. Uh, it comes with federal labor laws uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Davis-Bacon wages, uh, uh, worker protections, and, and other things. So, uh, you know, I think this is, and and we'll uh, we're going to have uh, out of the Education Labor Committee a very robust. Uh, training program uh, to teach people skills they need, bus driving skills, maintenance skills for electric buses, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, that will be key because it, it, this is gonna create, according to Moody's uh, and uh, Georgetown, uh, two million new jobs. And we wanna target people who've been left behind. Uh, we want to deal with equity issues of underserved communities, unserved communities, communities that haven't had these opportunities before. Uh, you know, in, in LA, they've got a, a high school, which is uh, a residential high school, because a lot of kids live in bad circumstances. It's residential. And they go there to learn uh, transportation trades. Uh, it's essentially a, a trade high school. Uh, and these young people are going to be so employable. <laughs> they're never going to lack for a job uh, for the rest of their lives. Uh, and uh, you know, we need to replicate things like that around the country, you can it to underserved communities. And that is another major objective of the president's plan. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, hear from other folks, their concerns, and then we'll take some questions. Excellent, thank you so much, Congressman DeFazio. I really appreciate the context um, and, and the differentiation between uh, the several bills that are out there. So right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna transition to our panelists. They each represent and kind of have a different perspective um, on this issue of transit. And I wanna make sure the attendees know that we're gonna let the panelists speak uh, for a couple of minutes about, you know, kind of where they're coming from on this issue and the importance to them. Then we're gonna open it up to questions from the attendees. 
Uh, you don't have ability to, to turn your camera on or your microphone, but what you can do is put in the chat the questions, um, or you can use the question and answer feature, whichever one is easiest for you. I have access to both. Put it, your question in the chat and we'll make sure to moderate and get those questions over to either the congressman or to the panelists. Um, and you can address who you want the question to be asked um, in your question. So appreciate it. Uh, looks like our live streaming is fixed. So we are up on the Chamber Facebook page now. Thank you, Heidi. I appreciate that. Uh, and we will go ahead and get started. First, I want to introduce uh, Eugene Mayor Lucy Venice. Uh, Mayor Venice, obviously, as her role in the community has a, a bird's eye perspective on how different issues like transit impact a lot of different populations. And so, Mayor Venice, uh, if you want to share a few, a few minutes of, of your perspective. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chairman DeFazio, for convening this roundtable. And thank you very much, Brittany and the Eugene Chamber, for hosting us this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts and hear from my fellow panelists. Just this morning on NPR, there was a story about infrastructure specifically road construction and how it has been used as a way to disrupt poorer and browner neighborhoods. As we address the challenge of climate change and the need to update and renovate our fundamental infrastructure, we have an opportunity to use infrastructure investment to change that terrible legacy, to respond to climate change with investments in transit that will reduce our dependence on cars and benefit poorer communities by providing affordable, safe, efficient, and frequent transit. The city of Eugene is deeply invested in this work. In 2016, the city council adopted the climate recovery ordinance goal to reduce community-wide emissions by 7.6% annually. That's about a 65% reduction by the year 2030. Reaching that goal requires not only commitment at the government level, but a community-wide agreement and willingness to make investment in both mitigation and adaptation. In 2020, a broad group of community members advised the city on how to achieve our aggressive goals. The roadmap is outlined in our Climate Action Plan 2.0, CAP 2.0, and many of the local partners, including Lane Transit District and NAACP, who helped develop that plan are here today. The CAP process made it clear that our future relies on significant investment in transportation infrastructure, including transit. Transportation related emissions account for over 50% of our community's emissions. We must take this sector seriously in the next 10 years in order to shift our trajectory towards a more sustainable future. Fortunately, we have a strong foundation on which to build and enhance our transit system. The Eugene area has historically had very high levels of transit service for a medium-sized community because the community has been willing to pay for this system through a payroll tax on employers. But I think it is fair to say that we still live in a car-centric community. It's a lot easier and faster for most people to jump in their car. Changing that takes investment. The work of the equity panel, which advised the CAP 2.0 roadmap, pointed directly at the need for improved efficiency and access to transit to meet the needs of historically marginalized communities for whom owning a car and maintaining a car can be a financial strain or completely unaffordable. The city and lane transit district are in a long-term planning process called Moving Ahead to identify and design improvements in the transit corridors that can have the greatest benefit in serving the largest number of people with affordable, efficient transit. You can see our model of transit-oriented development on Franklin Boulevard, which is the path of our area's first bus rapid transit route connecting Eugene, the University of Oregon, and Springfield. Private and public investment of more than $2 billion in that corridor created a heavily used multimodal pathway. But, as determined, innovative, and scrappy as we are in Eugene, we can't do this alone. Federal investment in transit is critical, not only for our city to meet our climate goals, but for our state and nation to make a positive impact in reducing global warming. Our climate future depends on increased federal investments that target innovative transportation solutions like transit-oriented development, expanded and integrated transit systems and other investments in the transportation system. 
This package must take climate action seriously and provide federal investments across this country to build our resiliency and accelerate our emission reduction efforts. Thank you so much, Mayor Venice. I really appreciate this. I know that climate justice is a, a topic incredibly uh, near and dear to your heart, and uh, I appreciate you helping us connect the dots on how transportation can really impact that. All right, next we are going to hear from Aurora Jackson. Um, AJ is the executive director of the Lane Transit District um, and, and obviously plays a very uh, intricate role in, in our conversation around transit. So AJ, I'll toss it to you. Thank you, Brittany. And I would do want to thank you and the chamber for putting this on. Uh, Congressman DeFazio, thank you for your continued support and allowing us to share our story with the community and talk about how uh, we are spending our dollars. Uh, let me begin by telling our story a little bit. A lot of people may not know, but when the pandemic hit um, and we went to uh, lockdown, closed down, stay at home orders, uh, transit was greatly impacted we lost over 70% of ridership as people were not able to travel except for essential trips. What we did is we took a safety first approach by suspending fares, uh, doing rear door boardings. Uh, we actually suspended some of the routes that we could not effectively continue to operate due to all of the protocols we had to put in place. What we had to do is really deploy in partnership with the union administrative employees and bus operators as we could to go out there and do cleaning and disinfecting to keep those essential workers that needed to get to work to work. Um, we had to change the way we did business from an agency that encouraged ridership to an agency that really was out there asking people to go back home unless it was essential travel. Um, well advanced of any mandates, we implemented mask wearing temperature checks and a lot of other protocols that we needed to keep our workforce safe and keep the public safe. We partnered with our local uh, public nonprofit organizations, including both chambers on messaging, um, follow the four and keeping people safe. What we needed to do at that point is focus on the health and safety of employees and the public, and really um, how we were gonna keep essential workers working to provide the support our community needed. Um, despite the challenging times, I will say our workforce stepped up and we had to make accommodations by having some people work remotely, uh, but all of our frontline employees continue to be required to come to work. Um, as you can imagine, those increased costs, the loss of revenue, and just a redeployment of the staff was uh, drastic. We had about seven different service changes within few months, shifting people's hours, moving people around. And we did not know how we were going to continue to support all those efforts. So we were happy when the relief, federal relief dollars um, came in that we knew we could keep service going. However, our increased costs have continued as we need to continue to allow people who either have been impacted by COVID because their kids cannot uh, go to school um, and as you know, uh, operators or mechanics can't bring their kids to work with them. So we definitely have to sustain those increased costs and maintain the cleaning and disinfecting um, and all the infrastructure. We implemented barriers in partnership with employees and union leaders. And all of this, of course, was at a higher cost as the demand was there for everybody. We also knew that we could not back down going forward on our commitment to climate change, sustainability. Our board adopted that by 2035, uh, LTD would uh, um, be 100% non-reliant on fossil fuel. So of course, in the midst of this, we were replacing our fleet. Today, we have 11 electric buses on site and we'll have the 19 next um, within uh, about 12 to 18 months based on the production of that. So as we go forward, we know these increased costs will be there and we have to be able to respond to our community. We know that our essential workers need us now more than ever and that we have to be there and respond in a um, responsive way, both environmentally and cost effective. Um, moving forward, we will be working in partnership with SUB and EWEB to look for solutions such as electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, 
and look at what is the best option. The bottom line is that we, what we learned from the pandemic is that our community really relied on us and those making the least amount of money were the ones that were most impacted. Today, we are still in the process of implementing routes that have been lost because we just cannot continue all of the protocols that we have to keep in place. So what we are working right now using our federal dollars to hire two waves of bus operators and other employees that will help support uh, implementing routes. Um, we are also focused on first and last mile options and active transportation. These are all the necessary tools that we will need to serve this community responsibly. We cannot continue to, to build double-decker highways somewhere in our community because how will all these cars move around? We know that through uh, good fixed route systems, good infrastructure like bus rapid transit and good active transportation that we can continue and build a more vibrant community. So that is what we have been focused on over the last several months. And um, I just really thank everybody for the opportunity for us to share our story. As um, I know a few of the other panelists will talk about what their experience has been from their viewpoint. So thank you. Thank you, AJ, I really appreciate it. We have about six more panelists. So um, hopefully we can uh, fit in one to two minutes from each of these panelists um, with their perspective. Next up, we have Chris Bailey. He is with the Albany Transit District. Mm -hmm. He's gonna talk a little bit about how a medium sized city where general fund dollars pay for their bus operation balances its budget in need for transit operations. Hi, thank you. Um, to, I wanna thank the chamber and the Congressman DeFazio for inviting Albany. Albany obviously is not part of Lane County. So um, uh, it's uh, great to be here and share our perspective. Um, Albany doesn't have a separate transit district. Our transit program is operated by the city directly as part of our public works department. Um, just a little bit of uh, background and perspective about Albany. We currently have about 55,000 people in the city. Um, we operate an inner city bus system that goes between Albany and Corvallis called the Limbent Loop. We have our um, Albany fixed route system and then paratransit that goes along with that. ATS, Albany Transit System, started in 1974. We operate uh, five days a week. We have a total of three buses operating on two routes um, with another five paratransit vehicles uh, each day. And our average annual ridership in a normal year is about 80,000 rides. Um, so quite a bit different than LTD. <laughs> But still, regardless of size, public transit is about providing safe, affordable transportation for our community, for people to go where they need to get to. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're providing a million rides or 80,000 rides in a year, that's the goal is basically the same. Um, just a little bit about ridership in Albany. We um, generally have transit dependent riders. Um, these are people who need to get to work or school or the grocery store or medical appointments. Our most recent survey found that 78% of our riders have an annual household income of less than $25,000. 46% of our riders have an annual household income of less than $10,000. So these are people for whom public transit is a lifeline and we need to be able to provide that service. Albany moved from a rural to a small urban city after the 2010 census. Um, we received federal transit funding through the urban, uh, small urban program, which has local match requirements. Our local match comes from the city's general fund. As you can imagine, um, there's a lot of competition for the city's general funds. Um, and the relatively small amount of local funding we receive has been a limiting factor in our service for years. Um, I want to talk just for a second about the Oregon Special Transportation Improvement Funds that came with the House Bill 2017. So this program is hugely impactful for us and represents what can happen when we receive new sources of revenue that um, supplement and augment our local funding. We're gonna use stiff funds essentially to double our service in this year, which is maybe not saying a whole lot going from um, three buses on two routes to um, six bus or eight buses on six routes, but to us, it's a huge improvement. 
It'll make our system more usable, um, more accessible to the entire community. So that's the kind of in investment in public transit that um, we're looking for and that and how it can impact even um, you know, small to medium sized cities. So even though the service is critically important to a portion of our community, we find ourselves regularly defending the use of general funds um, with the city council because there are just so many competing needs for that money. So any improvement in funding uh, from the federal government, whether it's through um, match requirements, improving match requirements or additional grant funding, et cetera, would be super beneficial to a community of our size and um, impactful to how we can provide the service to, to those who need it. So with that, I'll wrap up and pass it back to you. Wonderful, thank you, Chris. I appreciate your perspective. Next up, we have Bill Bradley. Um, Bill is with the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 737. He's gonna talk a little bit about how the rescue funds have helped maintain transit workforce throughout the pandemic. Bill? Thank you, uh, Brittany and, and the Eugene Chamber for putting this together. And thank you, Chairman DeFazio for your support for our apprenticeship programs and workforce development and transit in general. Uh, we are lucky to have you in the state of Oregon. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, what we went through in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it was the late uh, February, early March, sat down with Lane Transit District Management looked at each other in the eye and said, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna to get to the other side of this and, and hold on to our workforce that we have developed? They're skilled workers. You know, our operators are some of the best you can find anywhere. Our mechanics are some of the most technically sound you can find anywhere, and we don't wanna lose any. So uh, as we sat down, we started getting creative. We had to find, like AJ said from uh, LTD, we had to find jobs for them to do as we cut service and that included sanitation, keeping our service safe for the community and for our employees. And uh, once we got the CARES Act coming in, uh, we were able to take a breath, start looking out on the horizon and seeing how we continue to have a, a transit agency that uh, really supports the Eugene Springfield and uh, Lane County area. Uh, so with, with that, you know, we went through the summer, we went through many service changes, uh, all while trying to keep our employees, keep them working, keep them busy, uh, you know, investing in our service and in our training. Uh, so, with, we didn't have any stagnation in, in our investments by having this federal support, which was so vital. Uh, we got to continue to bring on electric buses. We have to continue our electric bus training program that we have at Lane Transit District. And uh, you know, as we come out of the pandemic with the additional uh, CARES Act 2.0 and the American Rescue Plan, uh, we can look into the future and say, hey, our fleet transition is gonna keep going. 2035 is the goal for zero emission buses. Our, our workforce uh, is continued to be developed, so we're not gonna be caught out by, uh, by this transition. Uh, so with that, you know, we are just uh, very appreciative of all the support we've gotten from the federal government, uh, from the support we see in the community. We, we flatlined about 12,000 rides per day in Eugene Springfield. And you know, that's 12,000 rides a day. Uh, that's nothing to look down on. Uh, that's a, a lot of essential trips that were we're continuing to make and our employees were, you know, very happy to continue working and, and providing that service for everybody. And, you know, we wanna see us back at, you know, 35, 40,000 rides today, uh, a day when, when we get back to the fall as schools open up and our community opens up. And, you know, we need to be ready for that. Like AJ said, we're making investments in our employees, adding about 20 more operators here in the coming months. Uh, we were able to retain our maintenance workforce to be able to support that level of service. And uh, we're very encouraged by seeing, uh, you know, what uh, President Biden put out with an $85 billion investment in transportation as a framework for infrastructure and seeing how we can, you know, leverage that to, to improve what we offer to the community. Uh, so with that, I'll keep my remarks short, but I do appreciate uh, the forum. And again, Congressman DeFazio, I do appreciate your support uh, for uh, labor and for transit. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate you being here. Next up, we have Risa Maddox. Um, she's with Capella Market, uh, and she's going to talk a little bit about how, how bus service impacts a small business like Capella Market and um, how her customers and employees depend on, on this service. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I want to also be respectful of time because I know that we have a lot of good questions. Uh, <laughs> What I would say is uh, one thing I do want to say quickly is we lost in March, we lost about a 
quarter to a third of our employees who were too frightened to come to work anymore, um, which was very understandable. And it left us with a much leaner team to work in a far more difficult condition than we had before. Um, and those that were left were those that uh, understandably were still frightened and also couldn't afford not to come to work. Um, our workforce uh, in pandemic and out of pandemic, most of them can't afford to live in South Eugene. It's simply not possible uh, due to rents that are insanely high um, for what we are able to afford to pay. Um, and so many of them are living in uh, Bethel, they're living in Springfield, they're living in North Eugene, and they're very dependent on the bus. And so we were in some of the most difficult working conditions of our life with a bus schedule that in no way allowed a lot of people to work either an opening or closing shift. And I really appreciate AJ's uh, very thorough explanation of how things happen. It's very helpful um, to hear about what, what deliberations were like at LTD during that very stressful time for everyone. Um, moving forward to what Capella Markets wish list would be for uh, LTD uh, after investment has been made. Anybody who has traveled Willamette Street in South Eugene knows that our major thing on our wish list is out of LTD's control, which is we wish for an end to road construction. And we're really looking forward to that. <laughs> um, but what we would like, the way that we feel we could be best served by LTD would be to have um, regular routes from as early in the morning as LTD runs to as late in the evening as they do so that we can actually have people who are, are bus dependent working closing shifts, which we haven't been able to do for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually put a huge strain on our operation at closing time uh, because we just can't schedule people as late as we need them to be scheduled to get that store as clean as we, we need it to be. Um, so we would love to see bus routes up and down Willamette Street every half an hour, all day, every single day. Um, or at least five days a week. Um, we would also, because a lot of our folks are living on those, those smaller routes that understandably had to be uh, axed, we'd like to see smaller vehicles from LTD that would take people closer to where they actually live at the end of their shift. Um, so that's kind of our wish list for, for what we would need from LTD. Um, I also do want to be clear that we're very supportive of LTD. One of our very popular benefits to all employees is a bus pass, and we'll, we'll continue to use that program and, and look forward to a day when it can, LTD can serve our, our employees more thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Rena Hensley. She is a bus rider with a disability and a student who's going to share a little bit about um, the importance of paratransit and how it's helped her during the pandemic. Um, so my name is Rihanna Hensley. I'm a citizen of Eugene. I also have cerebral palsy, a physical disability. I use a power wheelchair for most outings, um, including going to school. So starting during my sophomore year of high school, I started taking the LTD bus to, to and from school. Riding the bus, I immediately felt like I gained a new degree of independence. In my power wheelchair, I was able to go to and from school with my friends. Once I entered college, the city bus became a monumental part of my daily life. Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday, I relied on the bus to get to LCC, and I was able to be a young, independent college woman without the barrier of transporting my power wheelchair. I eventually transferred to the University of Oregon, but due to COVID, all my classes have been online, and I've been unable to ride the bus with my peers. However, I would still be able to ride the Thurston bus in and out of town. When school begins in classes again, I know the bus will be a vital part of daily life. For those of us with disabilities, we know school can present a unique set of challenges, but transportation doesn't have to be one of them. And I've been, I've constantly been using the bus almost every day since I was 15. Thank you, Rena. That's super helpful for us to understand how that service has been supporting you. Um, we really appreciate your perspective. perspective. All right, now we have Becca Jones. Um, Becca is a frontline worker 
Uovo, um, and she's going to talk a little bit about how she uh, utilizes transit. Greetings. Um, I first want to thank you, um, send out a thank you to everyone here today for sharing your stories and ideas to progress the services to our community. Um, as you know, my name is Rebecca Jones. I am a custodian of the University of Oregon. I want to also recognize the importance and amazing efforts of our bus workers, be it the cleaners or operators of the buses and stations. They have done a superb job of keeping buses clean and enforcing mass policies to keep riders safe. It is not an easy job and I thank them for their efforts in keeping the community safe. I am a user of the LCD system on the regular. It is my lifeline to the community, be it for events or day-to-day -day life. And without it, I and many others would be hindered in transit to many parts of the Eugene, Springfield, Thurston, and many of the surrounding areas. To give you an example, I work late nights and early morning shifts to get to my job. This is around 10 p.m. at night or 5 a.m. in the morning. Without LTD services, I would be restricted to paths that are either risky to my person, such as the river path, which is notably um, put on uh, for mugging as well as jumping or just people being in way that is very hard for people to see in visibility. Or they add a 40 minute to an hour delay for a safe detour. And even before I was part of the University of Oregon, I lived out in Pleasant Hill. There are four um, routes that come through there uh, four times a day. And without the bus systems, it would have been virtually impossible for me to safely reach my job um, in a reliable time. The bus systems allow for me and many of my fellows who may not have access to cars or ease of transportation to get to work in reasonable or safe times. This is a lifeline we could not easily recover from losing or even being slashed in any sort of way. The bus systems allows for me and my, and me and my fellows to commute safely to work and home after our shifts. It allows us to have access to grocery stores, doctor appointments, governmental offices, and so much more. And I thank you for your efforts in trying to help expand it and sustain it. Thank you, Rebecca, we appreciate that. All right, well, last and certainly not least, we have Eric Richardson here. Eric is the director for the NAACP here locally. Um, he's gonna talk to us a little bit about why a safe, reliable transit uh, system is important for communities of color. Okay, thank you, Brittany. And uh, thank you, Chairman DeFazio for uh, your willingness to put this together with the chamber. Um, the NAACP is an organization that's been around since 1909. And we're, we're an organization that cares deeply about the dignity and equality of all people here in the United States of America, recognizing the discriminatory, discriminatory uh, policies that really have gotten us to where we are and really helped build the wealth that we have in the United States. As we go forward, uh, we uh, commend this effort because it's an effort about bringing people together. It's a purposeful effort about investing in people. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we have to celebrate about uh, uh, the potential of our nation is that we put people first. We can lift up folks. We can make a difference for those in most in, in, in need. Uh, and I think those are values that we all share. And at the NAACP, we want to put those values forward, understanding that because of the past discriminatory history of our nation, our uh, we lost his audio. Lost your audio, Eric. You might want to shut off your. And camera. so, uh, economic development, as well, uh, is something that we look forward to going forward. Acknowledging that this uh, this plan is also an address to the the past uh, of fossil foolery <laughs> that we've been engaging in, uh, not recognizing its impact on climate. And so, as we go forward, climate jobs, uh, recognizing uh, bringing rural and urban people together through infrastructure are are the way to go. And we just commend uh, this effort, and we'll be here to help and bring people to the uh, to this discussion and support of this effort going forward. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Eric, I really appreciate it. Well, we have about 20 minutes left in um, in the hey, round here. Could so I just say quick comment on, very quick, on uh, just a few of the presentations. Uh, Lucy uh, talked about the uh, the equity issue. Uh, the president 
uh, in terms of looking at past inequities and how uh, communities of color were divided intentionally, uh, a $25 billion uh, pot of money uh, for that. I had policy for that in my bill last year. Uh, he specifically mentioned the Sun Sunshine Skyway in New Orleans. It's aged out. They got to replace it. Uh, a unique opportunity. So a lot of this Eisenhower era stuff is aging out. We can replace it in ways that are that rejoin communities more friendly for all users, not just uh, automobile users. Uh, and then uh, you know, Risa talked about a frequency, and as I mentioned before, that is going to be a new measure uh, which we are going to put on the transit districts with additional funding because we know it's a burden, uh, but we want to see more frequency because uh, that gives more opportunities. Uh, and then uh, and then Eric uh, talking about uh, the inequities uh, of the system. I mean, there are a lot of uh, communities of color. I've talked to a lot of my colleagues in the LA basin where you know, they, they, they've got people who get downtown and it's like two and a half hours on, on the bus routes and that because they aren't well served. Uh, we're going to deal with those issues in terms of better service. We're also going to deal um, with the fossil fuel pollution, which disproportionately uh, impacts uh, poor communities and communities uh, of color uh, through the overall bill, not specifically just in the transit se uh, section. So with that, be happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, Chairman DeFazio, Rob Zako, um, we uh, asked if he can put some thought into a, a question to kick us off. and. He has um, shared in the chat here. So Rob is the executive director of Better Eugene Springfield Transit, um, for those of you who are not familiar with that organization. And Rob asked Congressman DeFazio, he says, thanks for your leadership. As you know too well, politics is the art of the possible. Historically, that has meant that 80% of the federal highway trust funds goes to highways and 20% to transit. Um, the amount of the amount for transit has been directed to infrastructure primarily, not operations. Um, after three COVID-19 relief bills, do you see the Overton window of possibility shifting? Do you see the federal government playing a larger role in funding the needs that you're hearing about this morning, in particular um, for transit operations? Well, um, operations uh, were allowed in the rescue package uh, and the CARES package. Uh, and uh, also on an ongoing basis, uh, there will be federal money available uh, for operations, obviously, but we also have very large costs for the transition to electric buses and that, uh, and then training uh, for people to, to maintain and drive those buses. But yes, there will be funding for operations. The 80-20 split is just kind of an obsolete measure anymore because the Highway Trust Fund is $150 billion underwater for the bill I proposed last year. So uh, there will be a massive infusion of other funds uh, and uh, transit is getting, uh, under the bill I wrote last year, 106% increase under the president's proposal, I think 140% increase. Uh, so the, the, the old measure of 80-20 under HMTF is, is no longer relevant. I mean, yes, there'll be 40% increase in uh, roads, bridges, uh, and uh, highways, because we have 47,000 bridges that need substantial repair or replacement, major bridges, uh, down to minor bridges. Thank you, Chairman. Um, another question, and this could be probably geared towards Aurora, and, and maybe there's some uh, congressional spending that might be uh, helpful for this, but someone asked, why doesn't Eugene have free fares on the LTD buses like Corvallis does? I, I will say, um, thanks for the question, that's a great question. I will say that LTD has actually been used as a national model. Um, we have been exploring that possibility for a very long time and working with national um, agencies like APTA about a model that would be effective. Uh, free uh, fares is typically not free. As you know, in the past, we have balance between being able to uh, replace our aging bus fleet, operating service, and free fares. What we have seen is that for it to be free, it has to be something that our community wants. That means it's been a trade-off for a long time. And in the past, what we've had to um, challenge with is if we make it free, how do we balance that loss of revenue? That means in cutting service. 
And what we've done is we've invested in being able to put out more service as much as what we could sustain. And also most recently, as I mentioned, is really partnering with our federal dollars, with our local dollars, including uh, taxpayers here in our county, but the state dollars to really uh, do the kind of the, the big lift towards electrifying our fleet. And each the high cost of electrifying our fleet is something we've been focused. What I will say is over the long run, that may be something that we see we want to do here. Um, and I think these new federal package will provide us those opportunities. But until then, that just has not been uh, our focus. Uh, LTD is a system that operates above most agencies' efficiency. Our system pre-pandemic was about 10 million rides uh, per year. And for a community our size, that is really high. So that we've just had to do some trade-offs. So, but thank you. Good question. And it's something we're going to continue to explore as we move forward. Thank you. The, uh, the bill, uh, I, I expect the bill will include a, a pi competitive uh, pilot grant programs uh, mm -hmm. in various uh, communities to uh, experiment and see how much a free fares could increase uh, ridership. Thank you. Eric, it looks like maybe you had something you wanted to add in. Yes, uh, I did. I was just uh, just wanted to acknowledge this whole idea about free it, going forward. It's about the alignment of our of our industries and our, our institutions locally, so that we can start to pool our resources across different sectors uh, and, and really get innovative about this. And I think as we go forward with these new ideas, new infrastructures, we got to think about new ways of doing business and collaborating too. So I look forward to doing that and, and looking how we can reduce these fares for those who really need it. Thank you. Well, and businesses can get tax benefits uh, and there may be even enhanced tax benefits coming uh, in this bill for uh, providing transit passes to their uh, workers. I appreciate uh... I appreciate that being included because that's a conversation that we've had as a business community is that we pay a payroll tax, our businesses pay a payroll tax to help support um, LTD and, and trying to figure out a way to incentivize, incentivize businesses to then also pay to have their employees use the system um, is something that is of interest to us. Uh, so AJ, you touched a little bit and kind of segued us a tad into electrification. Um, you know, I know that the, the infrastructure bill touches on transit a lot, but that's not the only form of transportation it's trying to influence. We have a couple questions in the queue about um, electrification and the plan to add fast chargers in our state, um, incentivize uh, folks to adopt uh, electric vehicle use. Um, I think transmission infrastructure is constrained currently. And so um, the question is just how, how can we accomplish the necessary changes to that infrastructure? Well, there's uh, three parts of that or three committees involved, my committee, energy and commerce and ways and means. Uh, and we're gonna accomplish it uh, through a, uh, a joint effort. Uh, you know, every state was required under the FAST Act uh, to identify uh, key highway systems to electrify. Uh, we wanna electrify uh, those highway systems. Uh, we wanna do it uh, with a combination of direct grants uh, for public entities, uh, tax incentives uh, for private uh, entities. Uh, we also have to have a, a lot more sustainable power uh, for, uh, you know, to uh, run to those chargers because you don't gain a whole heck of a lot if you're charging your car off a coal plant in the Midwest. Uh, you gain something, but it's not what we want. Uh, and then you're also going to have to reinforce uh, the grid uh, to, uh, to wield that power uh, more efficiently time of day around the country, uh, those are very large investments that would be made out of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And then Ways and Means, uh, the, the president has talked about very large and generous subsidies uh, for adoption or purchase of uh, electric vehicles and even a new title for used electric vehicles, uh, which hasn't existed before. Uh, that will, again will be up to the Ways and Means Committee, but that's sort of the multi-pronged approach that we're looking at, uh, there will be, uh, you know, expenses for like, L you know, particular costs for transit districts because uh, with a concentrated fleet, uh, they may even need a new substation uh, located near uh, the uh, the fleet headquarters uh, 
or other reinforcement that's expensive. Uh, for dispersed chargers, uh, it's it's not as expensive uh, as it is for a concentrated fleet. So, and there will be money for uh, transit districts to help with that. That's wonderful and timely. I was just having a conversation with the property owner in town this morning who's looking at um, installing uh, charging stations in while the company would pay for the charging station, they had to cover the cost of electricity and it was, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if it was fully utilized. So I think any kind of resources there will be beneficial to get folks adopting that. Um, Jennifer Smith asks, a just transit, a just transition to a carbon free future requires high quality and high paying jobs in emerging fields. Um, so she's shifting a little bit, but she's wondering how the federal government is uh, helping to ensure that jobs will be family supporting union jobs. Um, so I don't know if in the infrastructure bill it touches on on the talent needed to, to build out this infrastructure. Uh, well, the majority of, of that will come from the Education Labor Committee, uh, working uh, with the unions to expand uh, their apprenticeship programs, reach out to uh, underserved communities and peoples. Uh, in some cases uh, for uh, technicians, we may well be working uh, with, uh, you know, the president's talked about free community college uh, with community colleges for technical programs uh, to prepare people uh, and even hopefully down to the high school level. You know, it was a horrible mistake when uh, Oregon under the pressures of measure five uh, eliminated what in my uh, generation we called shop class uh, to give uh, basic skills with uh, now it's CAD CAM for us. It was blueprints and tools and things like that. Uh, and when I talk to you know employers who like uh, LJO makes uh, uh, you know uh, equipment for constructing, which is going to be a big big uh, boost for manufacturing in this country uh, uh, for constructing uh, the uh, infrastructure. Um, you know they're they're having to start from ground zero with uh, with young people uh, in terms of those skills. Uh, we are starting to bring them back. Oregon voted overwhelmingly for uh, for that uh, a couple of years ago. The legislature has partially funded it, but that that's going to come back too. Wonderful, thank you, um, Chris Rawl, who is with Transportation for America, and I think your team is familiar with. Um, asked a very similar question to Rob's, um, which is relating to the 80-20 split um, that's been kind of the historical split uh, in infrastructure bills. So he, he uh, expresses his encouragement and support for upping the the investment in transit um, when it comes to that that infrastructure split. Uh, Duncan Rhodes asks, with the advent of self-guided and all electric vehicle technology, um, why not transition to a fleet that includes these, at least within the Eugene Springfield boundary? So I know that LTD does have plans for that. Um, perhaps, uh, AJ, you can touch a little bit um, briefly on, on your plan for electrifying the vehicles. Um, speaking directly to electrifying the vehicles, uh, as I mentioned, uh, by next year, at the end of next year, which is 2022 calendar year, we will likely have 30% of our vehicles all electric. The remaining 70%, we are exploring if a full electric fleet is uh, the best way to move forward as indicated uh, given the infrastructure constraints. Um, but we are very supportive of uh, moving forward with electrifying our fleet and seeking additional funding we do believe that at a very minimum, our system could support at least 50% of our fleet all electric within the next few years. So those are possibilities that we are exploring. We are in conversations with bus manufacturers, uh, not just looking at our 40 foot vehicles, but also looking at our paratransit and our 60 foot vehicles to see what alternative fuels, if not electric could support that. Um, so we're really excited about the possibilities. Uh, we hired a firm to really help that study along. So we're all in right now. We have a deadline of 2035 and we do believe that we can exceed that deadline. Um, and uh, in lieu of, of what we see the, the federal investments coming in, we do think that we would exceed that in, um, quicker. And I will say the importance of accelerating that is currently LTD has been running 18 year old diesel buses and that is unacceptable in our community. So uh, we are fully focused on making those infrastructure improvements sooner than later. Hydrogen has potential for concentrated fleets. 
uh, if it's renewable hydrogen, you know, the fossil fuel industry is pushing something called brown hydrogen, which is created with methane escapes and natural gas. Uh, no, no, no gain there. Uh, but uh, truly uh, green hydrogen, I, I had a demonstration over at uh, eWeb a year ago last summer with an electrolyzer, which a guy had invented, uh, very low cost, uh, and you use, uh, you know, hydropower. Uh, and you create hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen for a concentrated fleet would be fairly easy. Distribution of hydrogen over long distances is uh, at this point not feasible because you can't put it in the existing natural gas uh, pipelines. It brittleizes them and they will collapse. Uh, I was on a call with Bill Gates a couple of weeks ago and he's got a company that's looking at ways to line those pipes. So we could get to, to distribute in hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells. But right now, electrification is the best way to go for dispersed and you know potentially hydrogen for concentrated fleets. So on that topic, um, exactly, uh, Janine Parisi, who is with uh, our Eugene Water and Electric Board, says that EWEB and Northwest Natural, um, as well as a LTD, are currently exploring a partnership to develop that hydrogen fuel facility. Um, and, and she wonders, do you see an opportunity for funding to support innovations like that that would help decarbonize heavy duty vehicles, including our buses? There's some really great innovative stuff happening here locally with uh, LTD and Northwest Natural. And I think that's a great question, Janine. Right, well, the question becomes the source of the uh, Northwest Natural supply. Uh, you know, right now we have huge problems uh, with fracking uh, and the, uh, unbelievable release of methane in the production. Methane's way worse than CO2. Uh, I don't know where their natural gas supply comes from. Uh, you know, we need to crack down on those methane escapes. I passed a bill out of the house uh, last year that was uh, very robust on that. I had to water it down with the Senate, but we are gonna start to deal with those leaks because uh, as long as there is natural gas moving around the country, we don't need to amplify its impact by methane leaks. And at the, and at the wellheads themselves, uh, you know, there's been identified massive leaks. Uh, so, I mean, the ideal form of hydrogen would be to crack water, uh, or there's some other chemical ways which I don't understand to create uh, green hydrogen. Okay, thanks, Congressman. Uh, so I'm gonna have one more question here and then I'll let you uh, wrap it up. Uh, Becca Jones, who's one of our panelists asked, we have a bike tax to support bike programs in Oregon. Is there a possibility, maybe a bus tax, be it local or federal that could support bus systems? Um, and if so, how do we make sure urban or smaller towns uh, can be assured that they get even distribution of those funds? Mm, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you stumped me on that one. I don't know what a bus tax would be. I mean. Uh, we're talking about raising uh, general fund revenue to fund uh, massive new investments in transit. The president has proposed uh, initially raising the corporate tax rate, closing the overseas loophole. Uh, the 55 largest, most profitable corporations in America paid negative taxes last year. I don't think the American people think that's fair uh, when uh, they have huge profits and they actually get refunds. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's an ongoing debate. Uh, you know, I will participate in the debate. I'm not a principal because that's the Ways and Means and Finance Committee, Ron Wyden from our state and uh, Richie Neal from Massachusetts. Uh, there are many, many ways we can raise the money. I, I, don't, I don't know about a particular tax necessary dedicated to buses because we're talking about getting general fund uh, resources uh, and making a major uh, increase in uh, the funding. And then we do already have formulas that provide for fairness to communities in terms of distribution of those funds from very small rural communities up to the larger communities. That's wonderful, thank you. I think anytime we can uh, shift general fund dollars as opposed to raising taxes, uh, we'll be a lot of supporters out there for that. So, um, well, I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, Chairman DeFazio, if you wanna have a few closing comments, we'd. Uh, Love to hear your thoughts and, and thank you everybody for joining us. Well, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out ways to communicate uh, this, particularly to those, some of my colleagues are reluctant. And I say, look, you know, uh, when Dwight David Eisenhower came back from Germany and the Soviet Union arose, uh, the threat was the Soviet Union. Uh, we built the national defense highway system uh, to deal with that. 
Uh, it was to evacuate people from cities that were going to be decimated uh, by nuclear war and to move military equipment around the country. Uh, this is the 21st century. We have a new and looming threat, and that is, uh, that is climate change, climate crisis. Uh, and we have a great opportunity to rebuild a system that's aged or aging out uh, in a way that's resilient, in a way that uh, also uh, begins to deal significantly with climate change by defossilizing electrification. Uh, and we create millions of jobs and a lot of tax revenue. Uh, and the country becomes more competitive internationally. Uh, I think it's a huge winner. Uh, we just got to get through uh, some of the uh, knee-jerk uh, reactions in Washington, D.C. Uh, against this by some. Uh, and uh, I'm working as best as I can with my Republican colleagues in the House. Uh, we'll see how it comes out, but we've got to get this done. It's been waiting too long. Uh, the last major uh, you know, increase in federal assistance to uh, communities uh, and uh, states to help with infrastructure was 1993. Uh, that's pretty last century. So time to move on, 21st century. Thank you so much, Congressman DeFazio. We really appreciate it. Um, given all the, the political um, tension we have in our community and in our country, I really hope for a bipartisan agreement. I think infrastructure is something that we should all be able to come together and say that this is critical for all of our success. So I really appreciate your leadership on this. And I think you have a really pragmatic approach to how we can get it done. Um, we're supportive of you. Our business community is, is supportive of this infrastructure investment. And so anything we can do to help, please let us know. Thank you again to our panelists for taking the time this morning and for all that you guys do for our community. Uh, we really appreciate it. This will be recorded and, and posted on our website in case uh, you want to share it with anyone. And again, thanks to Oregon Community Credit Union for your generous support of our chamber and our community as well. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Great job, Brittany. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.